Welcome to my talk. I just wanted to quickly introduce myself again. Uh, I ha right now, I'm an application security engineer at Aspect Security. Uh, but I also spent about three years with InfoGuard Laboratories doing FIPS and common criteria evaluations. I have a background in computer science, a little bit of Linux, a fair amount of time learning about hacking at DEF CON. Also put my Twitter handle up here. And if you want, um, you can get the slides in detail at that link. Um, I also just wanted to mention that technically this talk should not be considered formal or approved guidance from NIST or NIAP. We're just going to kind of be talking about those standards, but um, I am not a NIST or NIAP employee. So the goal of today's talk, I uh, first wanted to just give you guys a quick introduction on what FIPS 142 is and what common criteria is. And then I'm just going to kind of talk about five security principles that I tried to distill from those standards and uh, just talk to you guys about those. So I, I try to gear this talk towards software and hardware developers or maybe people who are in charge of those types of programs. Um, security engineers will get a little bit out of this talk as well, particularly towards the end when we kind of dive into the weeds on crypto. So a little bit about FIPS 140-2. So it stands for Federal Information Processing Standard. Essentially, it is a set of security requirements. Um, it, the main doc, uh, document is about 20 pages, and there's also a fair amount of other documents that go along with it. it talks about approved algorithms, actual testing requirements. Um, implementation guidance is kind of serves like an FAQ on interpretations of the standard. It's a program that is established by NIST and then overseen by CMVP. That stands for Cryptographic Module Validation Program. So essentially, they manage the certificates for a FIPS product. And then the rest of the work is going to actually done by independent laboratories who then submit the kind of final paperwork to CMVP for accreditation. So you basically, you'll be concerned about FIPS if you are trying to sell a product to the federal government that does cryptography. Essentially, there's FISMA legislation that requires either FIPS or NSA-approved cryptography if it's happening within a federal system. And also, the nice thing about it is that it just provides a third-party independent validation of security claims for a product. So you can actually have assurance that a product that you're buying actually does what it says it does. A little bit about common criteria. It is also a set of security requirements, but it's structured a little bit differently. The initial set of publications were released some time ago. It's comprised of CC parts one through three, and they and SEM, and those essentially act as a framework. And then they are instantiated in something called protection profiles. They're, those are the set of concrete security requirements for specific product types. And they're kind of built on top of the original CC document. And the, right now in the US, uh, the people who manage protection profiles in the US uh, is NIAP, uh, National Information Assurance Partnership. So not only do they manage the actual protection profiles, but they also manage evaluations and policies and interpretations and things like that. And then similar to FIPS, there's going to be an independent certified laboratory that actually does the uh, evaluation and testing against the standards and then kind of submits the paperwork and, um, to NIAP and, and talks to them about final accreditation. And you are basically going to be concerned about CC if you are trying to sell an IT product to the DOD. So there are kind of regulations that require that for certain types of technology products used within the DOD. So these are going to be the five principles that we'll talk about today. And essentially, I, the way I group them is kind of the first three are going to be abstract principles. They're going to help you try to architect your security approach uh, or architect the, your product. And then the last two are a bit more concrete, and they will actually kind of just help you make sure that you've implemented your crypto correctly. I also just kind of wanted to talk about quickly um, why I put together this talk. The idea was is that now that I'm a web app security engineer, uh, when, I got, when I kind of changed tracks from doing this FIPS and CC to that, I wanted to look back and try to determine some of the most valuable lessons I learned and how to apply that forward to web app security. And 
what I realize is I kind of actually have a unique perspective um, living in both these worlds. And so I wanted to try and show how to apply some of these lessons to web app and um, IoT kind of security. I also just want to mention, you know, this is not a complete view, complete framework for security. It's also, um, this talk is not going to be a great way to determine if your product is FIPS or CC compliant. So if you're interested in that, you should actually talk to an accredited laboratory who handles that. All right, so right off the bat, the first principle is to define the security boundary. And on the screen, I actually put the requirement from the FIPS stock here. And essentially, what it's saying is that your device um, or module is going to be a combination of software, firmware, and or hardware. Um, and the idea is, is that all of those components are going to be contained within a defined boundary. So if you have, maybe if you're trying to accredit a piece of software, maybe it's just a, a single binary, um, like a shared library, or maybe it's a set of binaries that talk to each other. If it's firmware, maybe it's a PCIe uh, HSM module. So, it's a, so the boundary would actually be the physical boundary of the PCB board, but it also would contain all of the firmware and hardware components within that, um, that PCIe card. And lastly, if, it, if it's a hardware box, you know, it's, it's actually the entire, the boundary would be the entire chassis, um, and that would include all the ports and components within that chassis. So the next step on defining the security boundary is to define the ports and interfaces. So again, I, I put the FIPS requirement up here on the slide, but I wanted to kind of talk about why we do this. So the, the, and the idea behind the requirement here is that you define both the physical ports that are on your device, so that might be like an RJ45 port um, or even just a power button or something like that if it's a control. And then also the logical interfaces. So that's going to be basically all the logical signals going through the physical port. And the idea here is that you want to define your trust boundary and all of the points of entry into the security boundary. Anything outside the boundary is not trusted and assumed to be unvalidated. Um, doing this, taking this approach to your product and actually trying to define your security boundary forces you to determine what is trusted, what is untrusted, and also how it actually enters the system. When you're looking what's inside the boundary, it also forces you to flush out any unknown or third-party components within your application. Maybe it's an unknown API, a service, or a protocol happening across the network is one of the biggest issues I see. Um, it also kind of lets you determine what components are sensitive, maybe what components are not sensitive and could be excluded um, from security review if they're not security sensitive. And once you've defined the boundary and the interfaces, then you can actually evaluate the security implications of all of those. So as a security auditor, security assessor, I'm basically going to be checking the documented boundary and interfaces against the source code and against the actual implementation and just looking for any unknown or undocumented points of entry. And you would be really surprised how many you find. Uh, and that's going to include things like manufacturer backdoors, or maybe uh, if you're trying to certify an entire piece of hardware, sometimes it's like a daughter board that is connected to the, the machine that maybe came from your OEM. Uh, also, just developer test code. So if you're just evaluating a piece of software, looking at every single point of entry and exit actually lets you flush out what is actually in your application, what is actually exposed, and lets you kind of find any um, maybe backdoors that your developers didn't tell you about or just uh, test code that happened to get left in. So my suggestion here to start with this uh, and to kind of implement it on your own is to create a security policy that actually explicitly defines your security boundary and your interfaces and then to actually maintain that document. Um, so I also just wanted to quickly mention the common criteria approach. This is kind of separate, uh, different from the FIPS approach, which is to define the boundary. In this case, it's to define the, pro the security problem, the security objective, and then the security requirements. So the idea there is that 
the problem is basically going to be the nature and the scope of the security issues at hand um, and what you're trying, uh, how you're intending to address those. So for example, on a network device, a simple threat is going to be, or sorry, a, a simple a sample security problem is basically going to be like unauthorized administrator access, trying to prevent unauthorized access to the device. So then you have a security objective, and the, it basically states your intent on how to counter that threat. And so, for example, your objective might be to protect all communications between the device and an administrator. And then the requirement is basically a, written in a standardized language and defines how you are planning to implement that security objective. So in this case, if you want to protect all your communications between your device and your administrator, then your requirement is that all sensitive information needs to be protected with TLS or SSH or some other trusted channel. All right, so the second principle is to write a functional specification. So, and again, this is kind of the, I put the, doc, the actual requirement from the standard up here. But the idea is that your, um, it your forces you to basically write out each of the points of entry, um, each of the ports and interfaces in the module, and also why those ports and interfaces exist, what they do. This kind of, again, forces you to look for undocumented or unknown functions, but it also forces you to have a defined purpose for each of the existing functions that are exposed. If you actually force someone to sit down and write a couple sentences on why these things exist, they might actually rethink whether they need to exist. Um, it also just lets you ensure that there's no test or maintenance functions, and it also lets you determine what is going to be sensitive input versus uh, and sensitive output versus maybe control input and control output. Um, and this can look like a lot of different things. It could be auto-generated, like Java docs or things like that. Um, I tend to think that those are unhelpful without some analysis. So I, um, having a human actually sit down and look at the Java docs actually forces them to kind of determine what the actual purpose of those functions are. I've also seen just kind of high-level architecture docs that are actively maintained by like a product architect talks about at a high level what the, um, what the device looks like. And so I would kind of recommend just a mixture of both. Um, use the auto-generated docs, but keep them updated and put them in a format where you can add descriptions to them about why they exist. So the next principle is to prove the security of your CSPs. So a CSP is a critical security parameter. And basically, again, I put another requirement right from FIPS on the screen here. And what it says is that you have to protect all, or you have to document all of your cryptographic keys, your key components, and any other critical security parameter used by the document. So the way to do that is to essentially write a key management document. And it's going to uh, touch on all of the different points of uh, each cryptographic key and how it's used and why it's used. And we'll actually look at a sample, one of those, uh, in a second. But I just kind of want to point out that the reason it's important to write a key management document, it's not just an exercise in writing documents. It's important to audit any and all use of cryptography within your system. Um, the protection of these keys is going to be critical to the security of your device. So you should always know where these keys are, what, um, what they are, and how they're used. You should also just make sure that this document is actually actively maintained and occasionally even proofed against your source code. Um, and it also makes security architecture reviews a lot more um, easier. And even as a white box pen tester, it could be really helpful to the pen testers to kind of have a target list, essentially. So I just wanted to quickly go over kind of this sample key management document and point out a few things here. Um, I, essentially adapted this from a public FIPS security policy that's on their website. Um, in particular, this was a Seagate self-encrypting drive. And um, just wanted to point out a few things. So one is that you'll notice the first three lines are for a DRBG input. So DRBG is deterministic random bit generator, essentially like a random number generator, but just a newer term for it. And uh, I wanted to just point out that it's important to consider inputs to a deterministic random bit generator as 
critical security parameters because if an attacker knows what inputs are coming into your random number generator, typically those are gonna be used to generate your encryption keys and so they could potentially reverse your encryption keys if they know what your inputs are to your random number generator. So it's important to keep track of those, know exactly how big they are and um, how they're being generated. Um, in this instance, for the actual drive, you have the two AES keys in the middle there, the master key and the master key encryption key. And you'll notice that we actually have the algorithm that we're using, the size of it, where it's coming from. So in this case, we know that the DRBG is actually generating the master key. And then actually just also where it's stored and how it's being destroyed. Um, FIPS has a key destruction requirement that says you can't just unallocate the address, you actually have to overwrite it. So in that case, we would want to know exactly how that's happening. And then lastly, I also want to point out that in, in the FIPS world, authentication data is also going to be considered a critical security parameter. And you guys should keep track of authentication data in the same manner know what it is, how big it is, what format it is, how it's coming in, um, how it's being stored, so that um, you can keep track of it and know how it's being used. In this case, for a self-encrypting drive, there's probably a couple ways the password's coming in. Um, I think in this case, it was probably like a GUI comes up on the client box, and so they type in their pin on their keyboard, and then it goes through the, the USB port. So in this case, it was electronically entered because it's going through the signals of the USB into the device. So once you actually know what the critical security parameters are in your device, then it's important to protect them. So in this case, this kind of sums up a lot of the point of FIPS. The idea here is that you have to actually protect your CSPs from any unauthorized disclosure, modification, or substitution, and then actually document what that protection is. Um, so then the question you kind of need to ask yourself is, does your design documentation actually describe how your CSPs are being protected? Um, as an auditor, I'm going to be trying to prove the accuracy of this statement. Um, by doing a lot of things. I'm gonna be doing a source code review, um, I'm gonna be doing functional testing, I'm doing design documentation review, and then trying to check that all three of those actually match up. I'm gonna skip the slide on how functional testing actually happens in FIPS, but um, just kinda wanna shortly point out that a lot of these things are, a lot of the function, functional testing requirements are kinda similar to OWASP top 10, right? We're looking for undocumented backdoors, direct object references, authentication bypass, things like that. Um, but so as a security engineer or a product developer then, I think it's important to consider, you know, have you can actually written this down or considered it as a functional requirement of your product and then looked at the design of your product and actually make sure that it um, implements this? Do you have someone with the ability to actually do this type of auditing internally? Can they actually check the source code against your design docs and against the results of your functional testing or maybe your functional testing plan? Uh, do you have someone in charge of these design documents to make sure that they're not out of date and they're being kept up and matched up to what is actually implemented? All right, so that kind of covers the abstract portion of uh, how to look at security. Um, the next couple of slides are just gonna talk about a little bit more in-depth crypto. So on the screen, what I have is a threat that is from the, um, the common criteria uh, network device protection profile. So essentially it's talking about exactly how network traffic to and from the device needs to be protected. And essentially it says that any critical network traffic has to be protected and the device has to ensure that only authorized communications are allowed and that those authorized communications are protected and over a secure channel. So what does this actually mean as an evaluator? Well, I'm gonna be looking for basically every service, every protocol, every packet going in and out of the device to first try to determine if it's critical network traffic. If it's, and um, critical network traffic is gonna be just basically defined as anything that kind of lets you read or write 
uh, information that only an auth uh, authorized administrator would normally have access to. So a lot of times, the default assumption is that that is just the web interface. Um, and what we found, or what, you know, one of my observations is that a lot of times, other network services that are configured through the web um, portal are actually missed and not protected. Things like authorization, LDAP, or audit traffic, like syslog. Those are kind of by default unencrypted. And a lot of times, if they're sitting in a data center, um, people are going to argue, oh, well, it's this uh, syslog traffic is just going to go to the next machine down in the rack. Why do I need to encrypt it? And the, the short answer is that the uh, basically NIAP and NIST um, try to take the approach that you know, the trust ends at the security boundary. right? So anything that's leaving the security boundary needs to be actually validated and authenticated. So just because the machine is nearby in Iraq doesn't mean there, it might be subject to internal network threats. So as a product engineer or a security assessor, I think you should take this requirement essentially as a directive to encrypt as much traffic as you can, even if it's on a trusted interface. Um, just because it's an internal service like LDAP or syslog doesn't necessarily mean it should be plain text. It might give away design information or um, other type of sensitive information that normally only an administrator would have access to. In my opinion, I think uh, a lot of these devices need to start offering encrypted tunnels for things like these maintenance protocols. Even if it's optional for the user, at least then it gives them protection against internal threats if they opt in. And this kind of goes back to our original discussion about the uh, security boundary anyways, right? Um, essentially, the trust is ending at the physical boundary of the box. And anything going in and out needs to be validated and authenticated. I also just kind of want to point out real quick, um, one of the, the big kind of sore points I saw when I was validating network devices is this issue of uh, X509 certificates. It's still not being done very well in the wild. Um, the actual requirement written in the uh, the common criteria network device protection profile is that not only do certificates need to be validated when you import them or when you first use them, but every time you use them. And essentially, that looks like validating all of these different items every time you have an incoming or outgoing connection, right? And a lot of times, what I saw is that people will just use libraries and assume that their library is doing all these things well, um, when in fact, none of these things had actually been tested. And um, maybe their library did a couple of the things well, but not the others, right? So actually checking the entire CA chain for expired certs, revoked certs, corrupt certs. Also just checking that fields within the X509 data are actually matching up to what the RFC says. Checking extended key usage fields. The basic constraints extension says whether a cert should actually be a CA or not, and actually you know, OpenSSL will let you sign a cert um, using another leaf cert that is not allowed to be a CA. And so then checking whether um, your device actually catches that is kind of important. So the last principle that I kind of wanted to cover was just to prove the strength of your crypto, right? And in order to be able to do that, you need to be able to measure it. And so NIST actually has a really handy way of measuring crypto strength. They, they just call it security strength. And essentially, they, they measure it in amount of bits, and they kind of key it to like an AES, uh, symmetric encryption. So an AES 128-bit key has a 128 bits of security strength. And essentially, it's kind of the effort required to brute force that key. So, so in the case of AES-128, you need maybe one operation for each value, possible value in the key space. So two to the 128 operations, or 128 bits. So I wanted to bring up this table. This is actually just straight from a NIST document, um, special publication 800-57. And what it does is it um, puts all of the different algorithms that you might be using um, in each column, and it tells you what the security strength is of each uh, algorithm and key size. 
So AES 128 is 128, and then you can see how three key t um, triple DES is a little less, and two key triple DES is less than that. Um, in FIPS land, 112 bits is the absolute minimum. So anything below, uh, you know, 80 bits and below is essentially considered weak or broken and not allowed for NIST evaluations. Um, what I've kind of noticed is that a lot of people aren't really are aware of the security strengths of things like AES or SHA, but not really aware of the security strength of asymmetric algorithms, mainly because the key sizes don't match up, right? They just hear 2048 and they hear 3072 and they think those are big numbers and, and that's great. Or they hear guidance that RSA 2048 and SHA 256 is the absolute minimum and that's all, that's what they, they know and that's what they stick with, right? So I wanted to kind of walk through a TLS cipher suite with this table in mind. So as we talked about, AES 128, really straightforward, right? We find the, the algorithm and the key size in the table, we look to the left and it's 128 bits. In the case of TLS, the last item in the cipher suite string is gonna be your HMAC. And so in that case, SHA-256, don't have to worry about that, it's, it's nice and strong. But then the question becomes, what is the security strength of the authentication um, mechanism within TLS, right? And if the, in this case, in, if the Diffie-Hellman wasn't here, then your actual symmetric key algorithm would be, or your symmetric key would be established using this RSA certificate. And so people, uh, and so it's kind of uh, interesting to see that just a basic RSA 2048 key doesn't actually have the same, um, uh, key strength or security strength as an AES 128 bit key. So if there were no Diffie-Hellman in this case, then the overall security strength of your TLS connection wouldn't actually be AES 128. It would be uh, 112 bits of security if you're using like a 2048 bit key. And that's also why, uh, and this kind of explains also why RSA 2048 certificates are always paired with SHA-256, right? Because SHA is a little, um, <laughs> functions differently within a digital signature than it does in HMAC, and so the security strengths are actually different. And so SHA-256 gives you the, at least 120 bits of security strength in the context of a digital signature. And so <clears throat> likewise, the question is, you know, are you aware of the key sizes of your Diffie-Hellman Diffie algorithm? Uh, the Diffie-Hellman algorithm is used to establish the key that's used for the actual um, AES encryption, right? So it's, it's the one that is protecting your data. And if you don't know what curve size you're using in that connection, you could be using something that is insecure. Um, insecure meaning 80 bits or less of security strength. So it's important to really actually understand not just the algorithm that's being used, but the key size that's being used and the context that it's being used and what the equivalent security strength is so that you can actually determine what the entire security strength of your connection is. Uh, <clears throat> I also just kind of wanted to point out, um, for example, Microsoft has been using Diffie-Hellman 1024-bit keys in server 2012 all the way until 2016, even though 80 bits of security strength has basically been disallowed by NIST since 2010 or 11, and not only that, but they, um, it took them until, it took Microsoft until 2014 to disable Diffie-Hellman with only five 12 bits. I also just kind of wanted to quickly cover some algorithms, and this, again, is straight from a NIST special publication, and in the NIST world, essentially, there's the concept of NIST approved, right? These are algorithms that uh, have standards associated with them that have been vetted and approved by NIST, and there are certain key sizes that are disallowed, but in general, the algorithm is allowed. And so um, it's important to look through all of the algorithms that your system is using and determine if they are allowed or not, or weak or broken or insecure, right? Um, I put a few of these other algorithms on here because I just wanted to indicate that there are some algorithms that are not NIST approved, but also not necessarily insecure. Um, Salsa 20, Poly 1305, these are you know, encryption or message authentication algorithms. 
that don't have a NIST approval associated with them, but also aren't necessarily broken. They, um, so it's kind of a use at your own risk. I know, I think those two in particular that I mentioned are starting to be using in Chrome. So there are smart people looking at these algorithms and vetting them, but it's just not necessarily NIST approved. On the other hand, there are algorithms that are actually broken or are actually kind of proven to have less than 112 bits of security strength. And so it's important to remove the use of those algorithms if you see them in your system. I also wanted to talk about entropy. So FIPS has a very uh, interesting requirement, and it basically says that the security of the key generation method also has to be as strong as the security of the key that that key generation method is creating. And the way that's interpreted now is not only does your RNG have to be strong, but the actual raw entropy that your hardware is generating that feeds in as input to your RNG also has to have a certain security strength associated with it. Um, so I kind of um, wanted to step through an example with these slides and essentially, um, and to just kind of illustrate how having weak entropy could fail you in the instance of maybe like creating an AES key. So let's pretend that you're running like a Linux system and your um, entropy, which is essentially just the random data that you're trying to get from the environment. Um, let's say you're getting using Ethernet packets to feed in as your entropy, and you have two Ethernet or you have a single Ethernet packet that is 128 bits long, but the payload is only 64 bits. And let's say that that payload is perfectly random. So in that case, you'd have 128 bits of entropy, but only 50% of it is actually random. So in this case, we would say that we have a min entropy rating of 50%, meaning 50% of the data is actually random and the rest of it is guessable or insecure. So in the case that our system is only taking that piece of data in, we might feed it to our dev random uh, algorithm and then spit that over to an actual deterministic random bit generator and then ask our random bit generator for an AES key. And because we have 128 bits um, through that whole process, we're gonna get a 128-bit AES key at the end. But if your attacker knows the design of your system and knows what your raw entropy generator looks like, then they can just brute force that original Ethernet packet and recreate the process that you had and essentially break your 128-bit AES key in only 64 bits worth of work. So the way to solve that is to essentially right, double the amount of entropy that you're feeding into your RNG. And so in this case, let's say we have two Ethernet packets with the same length each. So now we actually have two 64-bit payloads. So we have 128 bits of actually pure random data. And because we're using a modern uh, deterministic random bit generator that lets us uh, feed in as much entropy as we want, then we can give it all 256 bits of output and then ask it for a 128-bit key, and we have some assurance that there's actually 128 bits of randomness um, contained within that 128-bit key. Uh, I put these uh, a bunch of links down at the bottom. You can look at the slides later or Google the names of these documents. But essentially, right now, there's a lot of different um, requirements in kind of NIST and NIAP um, uh, documents that uh, describe a bunch of basically design information requirements that they require about your entropy generation process to ensure that it actually meets this standard. And so I would definitely recommend to look at that uh, maybe, and there's also ways to um, analyze the raw entropy and try to get an idea of actually what the min entropy rating of that is. Uh, there's also a lot of third-party hardware um, random number generators out there that you can use as reliable sources of entropy if you're dealing with maybe like a high volume um, server or something that's creating a lot of connections that needs a lot of key generation. And then lastly, you know, uh, and we kind of talked about this on the previous slide, but you know, check, continually check whether your algorithms are up to date or not. Um, actually, 
you know, go online, you can check out NIST SP 800-131A. It's basically just an entire document that talks about transitioning um, algorithms, which are secure, which are insecure, and they update that every couple years or so, I think. All right, so that's, that's pretty much the rest of the talk. I, I think you know, the final takeaways are think through the security boundary, think through the actual crypto that's taking place, and try to evaluate the security strength of your crypto throughout the entire design of it. And lastly, just don't assume that the OS or the third-party library is doing crypto correctly. Actually perform functional tests using broken certificates um, or trying to create tests to validate that your um, crypto library is actually doing the math correctly. Check your protocol versions. Audit your algorithms. Audit them against NIST guidance and against the, your internal security documents. All right, so that's it. Any questions? Yes, so that means that it is um, uh, not allowed in digital signatures, but allowed in the context of hashing. Um, although that is not taken into context the recent uh, collision attack against SHA-1, so I think they are considering um, phasing it out, but right now it's still, I, I believe, I, I may be wrong, but I think it's still allowed at least in the context of hashing. Um, data hashing, um, for password hashing, that's actually kind of a separate thing. Um, PBKDF2 is the NIST approved way of doing password hashing. So it's, yeah, hopefully that helps. All right. Cool. Thank you.